Hello, and welcome to Sunday School with Pastor Josh. Back in 1999, I was working on the soundboard at a church uh, that my dad was the music minister at, and it was about Christmas time. We were working on some of the final production uh, rehearsals and those kinds of things, and as I was running sound, we were having some problems with the microphones, and there was a lot of feedback and things like that, and we were really struggling to get, especially the pastor's mic, to not feed back against one of the monitors. Feedback is when you hear those squeals that uh, are ear piercing. Well, after uh, a little while, there was a particular time when uh, the squeal was really, really ear piercing and really, really long. And I was trying to figure out what we were going to do to fix it. And then keep in mind, in 1999, I'm only 13 years old and I'm running into sound for a major production at a church. And after a uh, break or during a break, I should say, the pastor came back and sat down next to me and he says, I don't know what you think is funny or why you keep trying to make it sounds bad, but if you don't knock it off, I'm going to take you off the soundboard and don't think I can't. And uh, I was shocked. I mean, ouch, a 13 year old kid trying to do the best that he can. And the senior pastor comes back and says something that harsh. And uh, I know many of you can relate. Church hurts and uh, pastor hurts. And um, even uh, since then, I, I've struggled uh, with uh, forgiveness and with uh, forgiving him for that time. After a, a little while, he did come back and apologize to me uh, for thinking that I did it on purpose when he figured out that it was a uh, it was an accident. But I remember that exchange very vividly, and it was very, very difficult for me to understand uh, how a pastor could act that way. And even today, I struggle. I carry around that hurt at times, and it affects the way that I relate to other pastors and other people as well. Unfortunately, uh, that's one of those instances where although I really want to forgive for some reason, it's like I want to hold on to that grudge against him. And it's very difficult for me to forgive. And you think uh, we, uh, you think that it, it's, it's petty. And of course it's petty. It's, it's petty to me that I still carry that around, but it did deeply scar me. And for a long time, I really did carry that around. It was very difficult. And we all have those instances in our lives where we have someone who hurt us and who asked for forgiveness, and we've been reticent to forgive them. We've been unwilling to extend forgiveness. And worse, there are times when people don't even ask for forgiveness, and we're just kind of having to figure out in our own hearts, how do we forgive someone even when they're not willing to ask for forgiveness? And in both instances, we're really faced with a choice. Do we follow what Jesus says and forgive even in those difficult hurts, or do we continue on in our own sin of unforgiveness? Uh, like the pettiness of the struggle um, to forgive uh, the pastor that hurt me, Jesus tells us that compared to the forgiveness that he gives, that the king of all kings grants through him, that anything that we are unwilling to forgive in uh, pales in comparison to the things that he has forgiven us for. Now, there are heinous things that happen. There are heinous sins that happen against us. People commit uh, spousal abuse. People commit uh, child abuse, whether it's physical or mental or sexual abuse. All of these things warrant the right for a person to run away from that situation. Jesus in no way can commends people who stay in abusive relationships and says you should stick it out even when it's dangerous. What Jesus is saying is that there is a um, there is a place in our heart where we can forgive a person from the depths of our hearts and the grace and the forgiveness that he has given to us. I've, also, I've often heard it said that forgiveness allows a, a person to release a person from living in their heart rent free. Also, if we harbor unforgiveness in our hearts, the next step to that unforgiveness ends up being bitterness. And bitterness destroys our walk with Christ and our effectiveness in ministry. Bitterness is especially, especially heinous when it comes to senior pastors 
uh, associate pastors and elders who have struggled in churches where they refuse to forgive and they carry that bitterness into another church and it begins and does uh, infiltrate that other church and the way that he relates to them. It's very, very difficult for a person to minister while they are harboring bitterness. That is why it is so important, even as people who are not pastors, as Christians in general, to forgive so that they don't uh, carry around bitterness. Bitterness also destroys Christian relationships with our brothers and sisters. So it is much, much easier to forgive when we recognize the fullness of the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. If Christ is residing in our hearts and we've experienced the fullness of that forgiveness, it becomes much easier for us to forgive those who have offended us or sinned against us. Today, I invite you to open your Bibles up with me, and I hope you have your uh, Bible with you. I can get my book here. Oops. And uh, I'm going to invite you to open to the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be looking at verses 21 through 28 and then 32 through 35. I'm just going to read uh, verses 21 and 22 first. And we're really going to look at um, uh, what it means to recognize the forgiveness that the King of Kings gives us and the king of kings gives us and the forgiveness that we are to give to others now right before this passage jesus is talking about how to restore a brother through church discipline now many churches don't practice church discipline because they see it as a negative but in reality church discipline is a positive the purpose of it is not to chastise and to shame a person, but to bring a person to the point of repentance where they can be restored and we can forgive and continue on ministering together. Now, this begs the question from Peter. He, he says, OK, we're supposed to restore and reconcile. But Jesus how many times am I to forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? And this is verse 22 where Jesus replies to him, I tell you, not as many as seven, but 70 times seven. Wow. Just imagine that. It seems like Peter is giving Jesus an arbitrary number here about the amount of times he has to forgive someone. Why do you think he picks the number seven? I just asked you why you think Peter uh, gives Jesus the number seven for the amount of times you're supposed to forgive someone. Well, in religious life, the religious leaders and the rulers and the keepers of the law said it was right to forgive someone three times for the same sin. And after that third offense, it was right and okay for the person who was wrong to no longer forgive, but to withhold forgiveness. Thus, the legal requirement would be fulfilled. So when Peter is saying, shall I forgive seven times, you can imagine him standing there thinking. He's standing before Jesus. He's seen him teach. He's talked with Jesus. He knows that Jesus seems to aspire to higher standards than the teachers of the law. So he says, okay, the religious leaders say three times, so I'll double that, make it six, and then for good measure, I'll add one more. <laughs> so Peter is really, he, he's, he's seeing that the religious leaders, well, that's, that's probably not what Jesus is going to say, but let me say, uh, let's go even further beyond what the religious leaders say, just so I look like I'm okay here. And I'm going to say maybe seven times, maybe I'm a little bit better than those religious leaders, Jesus, or, or maybe your standard's higher than that, but maybe you're going to say six and I'll say seven and it'll just, it'll look good. But what Peter feel, fails to realize is that Jesus' standard is much higher than he can possibly imagine, and that Jesus isn't interested in us just checking off a box. What Jesus is more concerned with is the heart condition of his followers. When Jesus turns around to Peter and says 70 times 7, or some of your translations may say 77 times, you can just see Peter standing there counting on his fingers. How many times is that? How many times do I have to forgive? 
Now imagine Peter probably had some people in mind that he was uh, not going to forgive. He'd be like, no way I'd ever forgive them more than the three times that I'm required to forgive them. Thus, I forgave them to the letter of the law and I will do so no more. Now put yourself in Peter's shoes and think about that for a minute. Who are you thinking about right now that, you, that has wronged you so deeply that you've forgiven them a couple of times, but now you refuse to forgive? Can you think of somebody? I'm sure you can. We all have somebody that we really struggle to forgive. You think, well, I forgave them once or twice. That should be enough. And now it's on them. And yet that's not what Jesus says. In fact, he says we need to forgive an unlimited amount of time. He gives a number. But really what he's saying is that uh, there is an an um, unlimited number of times that we need to forgive a person. I think about what Jesus is saying here, whether it's 70 times 7 or 77 times. Who's going to keep track of that? Like every time a person commits the same sin and you forgive them, you're going to go home and check it off. Listen, if you're going home and checking off a box that you've forgiven somebody, you truly have not forgiven them. Because what you're doing is you're keeping track of their wrongs. And so you're looking at your, your, your chart here and you're like, we're up to number 74. I only got to forgive them one, uh, three more times to make it to 77 times. Nobody's going to keep track of that. The point Jesus wants us to understand is that the number of times we forgive is not important. What is important is that we get away from religiosity of good enough and we live up to his standard, which is perfection. That we forgive in the heart. That we recognize the fullness of how much we've been forgiven and extend that same grace and forgiveness to others. As I said earlier, there are some irreparable and even dangerous situations where forgiveness is an option, but reconciliation and the coming together again is not. When a Christian believer ends a destructive relationship, it doesn't mean that they failed to forgive. Let me say it again. When you end a destructive relationship, a dangerous relationship, It does not mean that you've failed to forgive. Reconciliation at times may or may not be wise or safe. However, in the privacy of your own heart, you can choose to forgive that person. Jesus forgave us of so much. And we can extend that in the privacy of our own hearts. It doesn't mean that we have to go back and have a relationship with that person, but that we forgive them for what they've done against us us. And if you've struggled with those types of issues, spousal abuse, child abuse, those kinds of things, I encourage you to pick up uh, this book called Making Peace with Your Past. It gives you practical applications of what it means to forgive and also what it means to reconcile, all of those kinds of things and when it's safe to do so. But what we're looking at here, what we're looking at here, you have to imagine that Jesus has just talked about people needing to be restored to the church. And so the assumption would automatically be that the people who are seeking forgiveness are uh, genuinely repentant, that they are repenting. They're not just sinning and then going, sorry, and then going back to do it again. They're genuinely repentant. They recognize that they have done something wrong and they are sorry for it. You may say, well, the person who genuinely repents would not continue to sin against me, so why should I have to continue to forgive them for those same sins? Because if they were truly, genuinely repentant, they wouldn't continue in those same sins against me, right? Well, you might have a point, except, what about the sins that we commit against God every single day that we genuinely repent for uh, and, and then go back and redo. Does that mean that Jesus shouldn't forgive us of all of those sins? See, all of us have those sins where we go back. It doesn't matter who you are, what age you are. There are sins in our lives that we return to time after time after time. And we go back to God and we say, we're sorry for those sins. And we really truly are. And God is faithful and just to forgive us when we repent of those sins. But so many times we're not willing to forgive others for the same thing. So the question that I have for you is, how then can we expect Jesus to forgive us of those reoccurring sins if we are unwilling to forgive others? Jesus doesn't leave us 
uh, hanging here. He doesn't leave Peter hanging here. Look at verses 23 through 27. He says this, For this reason, the kingdom of God can be compared to a king who wanted to settle the debts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. Since he did not have money to pay it back, his master commanded he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold into the debt, to pay the debt. At this, the servant fell face down before him. Be patient with me, and I will pay you everything. Then the master of the servant had compassion and released him and forgave him of the loan. Jesus is telling a parable here, or a story that relates to everyday life that has a spiritual truth to it. In this case, Jesus wants to give us a glimpse into the kingdom of heaven, the judgment of God, and what forgiveness and the compassion of God really looks like. In the times of Jesus, you see, the kings had absolute authority. What they said went, and the only person who could change what the king said was the king himself. And so for the king to declare that a person was to go to debtor's prison required that he then pardon them if he had already declared it. Also, you have to understand that during this time, it was very common practice for a person who could not repay a debt to be thrown into debtor's prison, their family to be thrown into debtor's prison, and all of their possessions to be sold until they could pay off the debt. But here's the reality. They cannot repay the debt because you can't make money in debtor's prison. So basically what we're seeing is debtor's prison is a life sentence. And here again, we see this reoccurring theme, this astronomical number of 10,000 talents harkens back to this astronomical number of 70 times seven that he previously referred to. So here's a question for you. What do you think Jesus is setting up here? So I just asked you, what do you think Jesus is setting up here? Well, by stating that the servant owed the king 10,000 talents, Jesus shows that there is no way in this world that this person could ever possibly repay a full debt. You see, there was so much money that he owed that he couldn't pay it back in a hundred years. He couldn't pay it back in a thousand years. He couldn't pay it back in 100,000 years, not 150,000 years, but about 192,307 years, he would be able to pay that debt back. So there is absolutely no way on this earth or anywhere else that he was going to pay back that debt. Now, I have no idea why this lender would ever consider loaning that amount to this servant. But that's not the point of the passage. Jesus made this story up. It's not a real story. So it's not like the the king is loaning these people money for real. Uh, but I just bought a house. So it was on my mind that uh, lenders are very frugal with their money uh, and rightly so. But Jesus here is telling us, however, uh, that there is a spiritual reality to this story. That you and I owe God an enormous, unpayable debt. You see, the moment that humanity sinned against God, our account went into the negative with God. There's an, an amount so astronomical that we cannot pay. Because, you see, God is eternal. And he is eternally holy. And thus our sin is an eternal affront to God and leaves us eternally unholy. And because God commands 100% obedience and holiness to him, the moment that humanity sinned, that was 100% became 99% or 0%. Because it doesn't matter whether it's 99% or 0%. Any unholiness makes us completely unholy before a perfect and holy God. And thus, the debt that we have in our sins to God, our creator, is enormous. And we wouldn't be able to repay it in billions of years, much less infinity. We can never repay the debt of our sin to God. But look what happens here. 
First of all, notice the servant's heart. He asks for more time. He doesn't ask for a pardon. He asks, just give me more time, please. Just give me more time. Please don't send my family and me into debtor's prison. We do not want to live our lives in there for the rest of our lives. I, I just need more time. Please give me more time. <laughs> Buddy, can you imagine the king's pulling out his calculator? <laughs> and he's, he's looking at it. And he's like, there's no way this guy would ever be able to pay this amount of money back. And he looks at him and he gives him forgiveness. He looks at the loan and he releases him. He has compassion for this servant. Wow, what a beautiful picture of God's grace for us and his compassion for us. We ask for more time. Let us try to work our way to you. Give us, give us just the opportunity to try to earn your favor. And God says, I see your, unre your repentant heart. I see your repentant heart. And I forgive, release, and love you. Now, the word compassion here has in view a movement within the bowels. In ancient times, in times of Jesus, there was the belief that the most, um, the most uh, intense emotions resided within the bowels. You ever feel something in your gut when you're angry or when you're sad? You feel it in your gut, and that's where they believed that the uh, emotions resided. So when we see that this king has compassion, we see that there is a deep movement of emotion with inside of him, stirring him up to compassion. Now, why do you think, and this is the question for you, why do you think the king was moved to compassion for his servant? So I just asked you, why do you think the king was moved to compassion for his servant? I think there was a movement in his heart because he saw the desperate state of affairs for his servant, the hopeless state he was in, the hopeless fate that he faced. And the king was able to put himself in that servant's shoes. He was able to look at him and, and have compassion on him as a fellow human being. And what's beautiful is that uh, this is a picture of God's compassion toward us. You see, he was willing to forgive an enormous debt all because of his love for us. You see, there was a sacrifice through Jesus Christ on the cross, which allowed God to forgive us our debt. Jesus took on a debt that wasn't even his and forgave us of that eternal debt. Can you imagine the punishment that Jesus endured for you and for me? But here's the thing. We are a lot like that servant. A lot like that servant. Because look what happens here after this. That servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. He grabbed him, choked him, and said, pay me what you owe me. And one of the servants saw what happened, and he went back and reported to the king. Some people would call him a snitch. But, you know, then after he was, uh, then the king summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you of all of your debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had compassion and mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. So also my father will do to you unless every one of you forgives his brother or sister in your heart. The first thing that we see is the resounding recognition that there is a great sinfulness in our hearts. There is great sinfulness in our hearts. There is a major character flaw in this servant. There's a deep seededness of sin that is on full display 
that is pouring out of this wicked servant's heart. He is wicked and he is selfish. He goes out and chokes one of his servants, demanding that he pay him 100 denarii. Now, a denarii was only a day's wage, and you have to figure that's a little more than three months' wages. This debt is very manageable, unlike the 10,000 talents. And so you figure within 100 days, he could technically pay this guy off. And however, the wicked servant has no compassion, even for this small amount of debt. And he demands that it all be paid immediately. And when he is unable to get the money from the servant, he does what his punishment should have been from the king. He throws the man into debtor's prison. What we see is that this servant was not truly repentant before the king. He didn't experience or care about the fullness of the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness that he was given by the king. You see, he was only concerned that something bad didn't happen to him. You see, there's this reality that there are some people who are going to say, God, forgive me. And he's going to say, away from me, I never knew you. Why is that? Because they never truly repented. They wanted their get out of hell free card. See, that's not what God gives us. God gives us grace upon grace and mercy upon mercy and forgiveness upon forgiveness through his son, Jesus Christ. And see, he wanted to forgive us. And he had compassion on us. And he tells us that we need to do the same. So here's a question for you. What does this part of your story tell us about the life change that should occur when we are forgiven by Jesus? I just asked you, what does this part of the story tell us about the life change that should occur when we are forgiven by Jesus? The grace and mercy extended by God through Jesus should indeed change our lives. When we experience the fullness of God's grace, his mercy, and his forgiveness, and we recognize the magnitude of our sin and the debt we owed to him, which was eternal, unpayable, we should be willing to forgive those who sin against us when the sins are only temporary. You see, if we're unwilling to forgive others of their sins, which in this parable is likened to the 100 denarii or 100 days work, in comparison to the 192,000 plus years that this other guy uh, had to pay the king, and it's an enormous amount that's completely unpayable. If we're unwilling to forgive others for that 100 denarii sin, how could we ever expect God to forgive us of our sin? See, once we've experienced that forgiveness and that grace, the forgiveness and grace that we have for others should overflow mightily. Or else there's the possibility that we have not truly experienced the grace of God. If we are harboring unforgiveness in our hearts, whether it be from a, um, a, a hurt at a church from a pastor, um, whether it be a hurt at a church from other church members or something that happened during a church split, or whether it be a relationship with a child and we're harboring unforgiveness or the child's harboring unforgiveness, or a, a divorce that was ugly or a person that cheated on their spouse, if we are harboring that unforgiveness, it is very likely that we are not experiencing the fullness of the grace of God. Now, I'm not saying that we're not saved because if we struggle with that and and we wrestle with that, that's an indication that the Holy Spirit is dealing with us with that. But if there's a place in our heart where we are just saying we are unwilling to forgive and it is solid and it is unpenetrable, even by the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness of God, we have to question whether or not we are truly saved by God's grace or whether we realize the magnitude of our own sin against an infinitely holy and righteous God. We sin every single day. And God, when his love and his grace and his forgiveness receives us with open arms when we repent. 
And we should be doing the same for others who wrong us. Earlier I said that debtor's prison is a life sentence. This parable likens debtor's prison to hell. Those who do not receive the fullness of the grace and the forgiveness of God in a life-changing way, where they truly repent and they come to God and they say, God, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. There is nothing I can do to repay that debt. There is nothing I can do that can rectify the situation I am in. I'm falling at your mercy seat and begging you for forgiveness from the bottom of my heart for my sins. And I believe that Jesus died and rose again and that he will forgive me and clear my account. Then we know that we have experienced that life change. We recognize that that payment could never be repaid and it is only through the grace and the forgiveness of God and that we then are able to live in a place where we can give that grace to others. Oh, how glorious it is to be able to forgive others because we are forgiven by an eternal God. The wicked servant took his grace for granted. He didn't experience the life change that's required. He didn't experience the fullness of the grace that he was given or the forgiveness that he was given. And thus, he couldn't give it to others and he remained in his wicked state. He goes out asking for a hundred denarii. He didn't care. A lick about anybody else. No compassion for anyone else. If we live our lives like that, it is very possible we don't know Jesus. It is very possible we don't know Jesus. So the final question I have for you today is, have you experienced the forgiveness and grace of God in such a way that it has radically changed your life?